Welcome back to Just Bricks, brought to you by Kick It Forward Podcast and Sporting News. Uh, I've got a very special guest again, Damian Martin, joining us to go through their WNBL finals, NBL finals, some NBA, and uh, also look ahead to some of the best players in the, in the world for Australia over in the NBA. Damo, how are you going? A lot going on basketball-wise. Pretty much, it's the, uh, you know, you've got everything going on right now. Yeah, it's the most exciting time of the season when it comes <laughs> to the NBL, the WNBL, and then obviously some big news outside of the grand final series and people going to the NBA, you know, coaches returning. So, yeah, wonderful time to be involved in the sport. Do we just start on the NBL? Uh, we now have our semi-final series. We have the Jack Jumpers taking on the Perth Wildcats, Melbourne United taking on Illawarra. Um, do you see where do you see these two going we'll start with the wildcats obviously you've played a bit with them um what do you think the outcome how do you think they'll approach that one oh look i think it's going to go to the third game i think that the tassie jack jumpers just their disciplines of moving the ball executing their timing is incredible so if the wildcats let let them move the ball wherever they want at the timing that is you know appropriate for them then it's going to be a real struggle because I don't know if they'll get enough stops to get out and run and be at their best, which is an offensive transition. So the disciplines that the Tassie Jack Jumpers have might try and expose some of the um, the tendencies that the Wildcats have had of being more of a, okay, let's make sure that we're in a stance, let's make sure we clog up the keyway, but are they going to get out there, get in a denial and make the Tassie Jack Jumpers go to plans B, C and D at one end. But then with the Wildcats, if they can get some stops and they win the rebound count, you know, I don't think the Tassie Jack Jumpers will be able to contend with them if it's a fast paced, up-tempo game. Uh, so the Wildcats, I think they will do whatever they can at the defensive end. And if they can get some stops, kick it aheads to Jordan Asha, to Bryce Cotton, get into that transition game with Keanu Pinda running the lanes as well and getting his head on the ring, then they, they're going to put up some points. Uh, are you surprised how much sar has been involved in the postseason? Like the fact that uh, this guy who, you know, he's done enough to secure his spot, he's, <laughs> he's five to 10 million US, depending on how much he is for where he goes in the lottery. Um, the fact he's so hungry to compete through the finals. Not at all. Um, <laughs> like I know that sounds silly, but until you get to know them as a person, more so than just what the outside looking in believes he should be doing if he wants to go number one, two or three in the NBA draft, that's taken care of. But you don't get to the level he is without being a competitive beast. So first and foremost, he loves winning. He loves coming up against the best. He wants to try and win championships. And that's what's motivated him to get out early and get on the training, get on the court, to stay late after training sessions, to then work on his diet, his weights, whatever it might be. So first and foremost, he got to where he is, not just because he grew up to be seven foot three and it turns out he can put the ball through the hoop. He got there because of his competitive nature. And that is shining through now where he's the first person to go to JR and say, do not bench me. If you think I can help this team win, I want to play as much as possible. The rest will take care of itself. And I love that attitude. We talked about last week when we, uh, the other week when we left, um, you're, you're someone involved in the agency game right now. When you see a guy like him who's going at it like this at such a young age, uh, what does that make you think for you know being in the industry when you see someone like that or how you approach other talent? Well, I love it. You know, you go back to LaMelo Ball when he first came out here and the amount of attention that he brought to the NBL uh, because of the following he had on social media was incredible. But whilst he was playing some amazing basketball, when the Illawarra Hawks weren't going to play finals, I thought that they shut it down a little bit with him because he had done enough mm. to get drafted in the top five. I think he went fourth in the end. But then you look at, you know, obviously Alex Saar, who we just mentioned, they're in finals contention. There's a championship on the line and he just wants to do whatever it takes to win a championship and then he'll turn his focus to the lottery. So for me in the sports management game, whilst I'm not an agent, I am fortunate enough to work with the agents who represent someone like a Rocco Zakarski, who I think in 12 months time, he'll be in the same boat. You know, do I want to do whatever it takes to help the Brisbane Bullets win a championship and then worry about the NBA draft? And getting to know Rocco, he is one of the most competitive people I know. He wants to prove that he's the best center in not just Australia, but in the world. And you've got to have these big goals, high aspirations and determination. Otherwise you start taking shortcuts. Otherwise you start thinking oh maybe i should rest maybe i should sit out which great player in any sport <laughs> have you ever heard that have that mindset of no no i've done enough i might just take this day off this game off it's uh yeah you, you don't fluke brilliance and that's why the people who do these amazing things get there because it doesn't even cross their mind to take some games off especially not at 18. Well, you don't no. <laughs> <laughs> no definitely not uh, we'll stay with the nbl melbourne united take on the illawarra hawks uh, justin tatum he's really taking this team that were absolutely struggling at the start of the season uh, found found players like Date Hickey uh, to fill yeah. a role. Um, really inspired this team. You, 
and sometimes that all it takes that's all it takes for a team um have you been surprised at the turnaround and what have you made of his coaching changes I got to interview him a few times. He's a very likable, charismatic guy. And so when you've got that in your coach, who's also so passionate and he instills so much confidence in each play. And you mentioned Hickey, and I'm getting a little sidetracked here, but I don't mind admitting <laughs> that I was a, a little fanboy. And after what I witnessed him do in game three of the decider, there was sorry, in the playing game, I actually reached out to him via Instagram. I was really? like, hey, just couldn't help myself. Just <laughs> want to say, I love what you did because he is a guy that got given an opportunity, has grabbed it with two hands and gone with it. And that's under the guidance of a new coach. So to get back to Tatum, I've always believed that players are at their best when they're physically fit, they're mentally switched on and they're full of confidence. Two of those three things the coach can really help out with, with the confidence and making sure their players are mentally switched on and present. And we're seeing that from Hickey in particular, but across the board, all the players really want to do whatever it takes to help win because they admire and respect their coach because of what he's brought to them. Yeah, it's, it's uh, going to be an exciting series to watch. I don't, I don't know how that one's going to play out. You'd, you'd have to tip United. Who are your two tips then for the grand final series yeah i'm going with home court advantage i do think both series go to a deciding game i think mm. the melbourne united have the potential to win it in two obviously they and the perth wildcats have had an extended break but the depth of the melbourne united team you know you don't it's so hard to win 20 games <laughs> you know you don't just have teams handing you the win in this day and age so to get to 20 they have been the form team of the season i think they've still got another level they can get to i think shay illy will be the difference joe lowell Acure, i'm not sure who who's going to be able to match up and contend with him. I think Froling is absolutely brilliant and he'll get his at one end. But with what he's going to be required to do in the amount of pick and rolls where he's going to have to be a hard show, he's going to have to get out there, take get the ball out of the guard's hands and then try and get mm. back to Joe who's going to roll to the basket. Froling is a superstar. We saw the import guards step up when it mattered. But in the end, I think Melbourne's depth and their defensive ability, they're the best defensive team in the league. And I think that might just be too much uh, at the end of it for Illawarra to get through to a GF. This is a random one, but uh, before we move on, um, uh, Ryan Rosillo, he's got a huge podcast in the US, but he randomly was in New Zealand earlier in mm -hmm. the year and went to um, a Breakers game. And he was surprised at how how hard all the players play here. And maybe, maybe it is because, you know, they're fighting to get to another league or they're just fighting because they have one or two games a week. What do you what do you put it down to in the NBL where there, there is a standard probably of uh, consistency with the intensity game to game that you might not get in every NBA game? Well, the NBA, you got 82 regular season games uh, and then finals where you got best of five, best of seven, best of seven. Like it's yeah. ridiculous amounts of games. They can play the same amount of games in the postseason than we do in a whole regular season. <laughs> so for the first three quarters of a game, if you go and attend an NBA game, it's almost like, yes, they're competing, but they're not going to go dive on a loose basketball. Yes, they're competing, but if they can't slide over and take a 50-50 charge versus block, they're not even going to put themselves in that position. They'll give up an open layup at times. Whereas in the in the NBL, you know, we kind of say that we're full-time trainers, part-time players. <laughs> so by the time we actually get out there to play, every possession matters. It's only 40 minutes opposed to the 48 minutes of the NBA. And it's just ingrained in every single player that grows up in basketball in Australia that every possession does matter. And the numbers will tell you, you know, I think in the last five seasons, the final four teams or the final teams that make the playing tournament as well have come down to the last game of the regular season. And it could be down to percentages. So the whole thing in the NBA, if someone scores a basket on the buzzer and then all of a sudden there's push and shove because it's disrespectful, it's an absolute joke. <laughs> Here it does matter because that percentage could be the difference between giving yourself a shot at playing postseason basketball or starting Mad Monday early. So yeah, the, the NBA will play way harder every single possession. I want to say there was a story with Della Vadova that it was, he was not liked at all in the NBA by some opposing teams mm. because he was more than willing to dive on a loose basketball. And the mindset baffles me because you're getting paid so much money to play a sport that you love, yet because you're getting so paid so much money, you don't want anyone diving on a loose ball because if your ankles are around that ball, potentially you get injured. Mm. For me, it's the opposite. You're getting paid so much money that you should be willing to put your body on the line regardless of what it might result with potentially having to spend time on the sideline or whether you get a second or third contract. You've earned enough to put your body on the line. Delhi did that. His teammates love it. I've always respected it, but not many are willing to do that in the NBA. And there are a few, and they're the players I admire the most. <laughs> oh, you don't mind it, Pat Bev. I was going to say, Pat Bev, <laughs> <laughs> like every possession, he's trying to get under the skin of the opposition. He doesn't care what they think of him. He's there to win. That's his job. It's what he gets paid to do. He loves it and he embraces it. We had a weird path to get there as well, but that's. Um, I just find it funny also with the Australians, like Delhi probably doesn't talk much shit. 
No, he's none. Dead son. So he's <laughs> running through a brick wall, taking charges, diving, and then the guys are not. He, uh, not many Australians talk on court because it's so ground out of you at an early age. And that's what even Bryce Cotton said. He found that interesting here when the guy is just destroying you but not saying anything. Yeah, uh, the only time I re ever really heard BC talk trash was, the, was with Casper Ware. So the two American imports going at it. And I remember just being on court and they'll just kind of chirp because I was guarding Casper yeah. and Bryce was there and Casper's behind me. And they were just chatting kind of over my shoulder and I was, was sitting there dead silent going, this is awesome. <laughs> like, but yeah, you're right. We don't do it. And Delhi, going back to him in the NBA and how he guarded, Remember, he got hospitalized due to fatigue <laughs> yeah. and dehydration yeah. during that final series against the Golden State Warriors. Not many players can say they put their body to that extent that they had to get to go to hospital and be put on a drip. Uh, before we go to the WNBL, let's just stay with the NBA. We have a new Australian next year in the NBA, a two-way contract signed by Jalen Galloway um, for the Bucks, which is a huge achievement and also probably points to the fact that uh, the trend right now for scouts is looking at the NBL. This yeah. is a guy that 10 years ago you know, you never get that contract. Yep. It's 22 players now since 2015 have gone from the NBL to the NBA. Wow. You know, whether that's next star players, Aussies, Americans, whoever it's been, but 22 is amazing. So the next star program, Liam Santa Maria and the NBL, kudos to everyone involved. It does bring GMs and scouts out to Australia. And all of a sudden, instead of watching, you know, some of the NBL games, you know, live streaming on the other side of the world, we don't fully get to appreciate the athleticism or skill set of someone like a Jalen Galloway. Now they're here potentially to watch one of the next stars. Yeah. And they're like, well, hang on, who's this other player out there on the court? They figure out he's very young as well. Mm. And I remember Andrew Bogut um, and Luke Longley about 12 months ago, I was just sitting courtside before the Wildcats Kings game was about to tip off, just having a quick chat with them during warm up. And they just said, Galloway is incredible. Keep an eye on this mm. player. So they saw it from a young eight, from saw it within him whilst he was still quite young. And then fast forward 12, 18 months and he's been rewarded with that contract. He had an amazing start to the season too. But like, I, I think it is a bit like that Wemby Nyama effect last year with Koulibaly getting taken. Like he doesn't mm. become a, a lottery pick <laughs> unless you've got 10,000 scouts. <laughs> yep. And I think there is a bit of a, a, bo a confirmation or unconscious bias there where, you know, people think they're making up their own decision, but you know, he might be the one guy you see other than Wembenyama. But anyway, um, what about Paddy Mills? He signed with uh, the Miami Heat uh, for the rest of the season. Does he play? Like, is this the best place he could have gone? Is this another win for the Heat to find a guy who's randomly going to perform in the postseason? Yeah, and he's also a guy that doesn't even have to get on the court to make the team better. Mm. You know, you look at what he did back in his early days in Portland where there was, he was that guy that used to wave the white towel on the sideline. He was the, you know, the, the locker room guy, the culture guy. And then he goes to San Antonio and I think it's actually 10 years to the day where he absolutely killed Miami Heat in the NBA Finals. He was electric uh, when they won their fourth game of the series. He, he can put the points on the board. He can spread the floor because of how well he shoots the ball. But more than anything, he's going to bring out the best in his teammates because he doesn't take a day off. He's got elite daily behaviors. And anybody who sees what Paddy puts his body through on a daily basis, they're going to have respect for him. And I think it's a great fit for him. They've, they're loaded in the backcourt. Yeah. Uh, so whether he gets that many minutes or not, you know, we'll soon find out. But does he make them better? Yes. Uh, does he deserve some game time? Definitely give him the opportunity. And if he knocks down a couple of quick threes, then I think you'll see him spend some extended time out there during the finals. I mean, postseason so long in the NBA, a lot of injuries last year, a lot of guys with Miami got a, mm. a, the shot from that. Uh, just staying on that, you've been to an Olympics before with the Boomers. Uh, we're talking about this. With a guy like Paddy Mills who's coming out of this season, not playing that much, with the so many uh, players with NBA experience and really good NBL players. So how much does the tournament itself change the way you play and the people that they play? Like, or is it, I, I know from junior stuff that would always happen, but is mm -hmm. that the same when it comes to the men's situation? Yeah, like anything, uh, you know, you see during the course of regular season, rotations change, players go through form slumps or they go through purple patches and that can happen within the course of a tournament as well. There could be injuries. So, you know, going just, uh, the one experience I was fortunate enough to have was at the Rio Olympics, the first two games I didn't actually play. So they played France game one, Serbia game two. And I remember sitting on the bench and it's the most inspired I've ever been playing basketball, yet I didn't actually step foot on the court <laughs> because I sat there and I was watching Paddy Mills and Della Vadova who were both in the NBA at that stage, our best two players alongside Bogut and, and Ingles. 
But the things that they did at the defensive end, I'll never forget. They were just fighting through every single screen. They were making sure they didn't take any shortcuts. They were being physical. It was just amazing. And it resulted in the Boomers getting back-to-back -back wins to open the Olympic campaign. Because we put ourselves in such a good position, they wanted to give some time uh, and rest, you know, Delhi and Paddy in particular, because of their extended minutes and the physicality in mm. which they'd embraced in the first two games, that I got given an opportunity and a few of the other guys got an opportunity for a few more minutes. You know, I think it was China was the first one. And, you know, by the time we'd gone through a few games, all of a sudden we're facing Lithuania and I got called way earlier than I was expecting or way earlier than we'd seen earlier in the in the campaign. And then by the time it was the semifinals, I was first off the bench. So was very lucky that it's just a, a long tournament. You can play yourself in or play yourself out. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what the coach believes is best for the team. But again, going back to what those two players did, I've never been more inspired, even though I got a DMP. <laughs> so it probably worked out well. It's probably why. That's pretty high praise from a six-time NBL uh, Defence Player of the Year. Um, just lastly, WNBL Grand Final Series is set. Perth take on the Southside Flyers. Uh, you have this really inspiring, really fun team to watch, Perth Lynx, that have sort of come out of nowhere knocking off the Townsville fire. And that's without any bias, obviously, being in Perth. Uh, taking on the Southside Flyers with the GOAT, Lauren Jackson, dropping 38 <laughs> to put them in the final. Um, who are you going for? You want to see... Uh, uh, is it, do you count Aldebrew Donga as New South Wales? Is that... Aldebrew's New South okay, Wales. Aldebrew's, okay, yeah, cool, Wodonga's cool. on the other side. So you, yeah. uh, who are you going for? Lauren Jackson or the Perth Lynx? I'm going for Lauren Jackson to be the grand final MVP in a losing okay, series okay. <laughs> against the Lynx. It's, you can't script this. How is she dropping 38 in the deciding game of a grand final series off the back of a ruptured Achilles tendon, <laughs> off the back of what she did to help the Opals win a bronze medal at the World Champs? She's just amazing. Mm. Like, just what she's done since she returned to the game, I think, has been more inspiring uh, than anything she did when she was at the prime of her game, you know, when she was the best player in the world. <laughs> so I cannot wait to see LJ out there. Uh, it's completely fitting if she goes out with another WNBL championship. Uh, but, you know, obviously based in Perth, I do have a bias towards <laughs> the Lynx. Uh, we've got a couple of the players that we represent on the Lynx. So I can't wait to see Steph uh, Gorman and, and Mackenzie do really well. But, you know, what we've seen from McDonald, you know, the Lynx lost seven of eight games when Ari McDonald was out injured. Wow. And then it comes down to Sydney versus Townsville in the final game of the regular season for the Lynx to know whether or not they're even playing in the postseason. Result goes their way. They knock out Townsville and all of a sudden they're off to a GF. But Amy Atwell, Ari McDonald, those two are in an incredible backcourt to watch. They love putting points on the board. And then you've got Annalie Maley, who's is she, is she a power forward? Like she's an undersized power forward or a small forward. But <laughs> how she managed to get as many rebounds she does. She nearly had a triple-double in the last game against Townsville. Uh, they just keep getting it done and they're well-balanced. And Ryan Petrick is renowned for just wanting to be high tempo, run and gun, have some fun, shoot some threes. He's got the balance slightly better now where there's a bit more uh, offensive structure to it, in my opinion. And he is throwing someone like a Steph Gorman out there purely to throw onto the opposition's best player. It's get in a stance, make it hell for him. And to have that amount of trust in a rookie speaks volume, not only to Gorman, but the amount of trust that Ryan has in her. Just on Annalie Malley, she's like this smiling assassin. You think um, she's so nice, she's very like friendly person, mm. but then she she just is so aggressive on the rebound <laughs> side. 20 rebound games as she's so under size. I, I don't know how she does it. Yeah, so it's going to be a great WNBL final series. So much basketball right now. Thanks so much for joining us again, Damo. Um, Enjoy. Are you on the call coming up or anything? Yeah, or? I'll be on the call for the Perth Wildcats game. Brilliant. And I'll be sitting there uh, at the Perth Lynx. Uh, yeah, some semi-final games coming up this week in the NBA. Who, are you, who do you think will win? Who do I think will win? Uh, I reckon I reckon Melbourne United just because of their depth. Yep. But like, it would not surprise me if Bryce has two 40-point games in the, in the grand final series. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as... As far as the WMU, I'll probably have to go with Southside Flyers. They've been they've been pretty dominant when they have been. Mm. And um, I again, just because of the GOAT, I like I love watching her. It's been so cool to watch her. And even in the FIBA World Cup, when she had that huge game for the bronze medal and things like that, I think she steps up in the big games. And she's the type of person, not just player, but the type of person where as hard as it will be for the Lynx if they were to lose it, I could imagine by the time the initial emotion subsides, they're sitting in the locker room going, well, if we we're going to lose, I'm glad it was to Lauren. <laughs> like, she's that type of person and player. Yeah. Um, thanks, Gon. My pleasure, mate. Thanks, Gon. <laughs> Sorry. Uh,
we had a special interview this week with one of your uh, colleagues, Peter Hooley, taking us through the NCAA. Some of the young stars to check out. Make sure you subscribe to the pod, review the pod, and um, there'll be plenty more on this feed and also the Kick It Forward feed to come. Hello, welcome to Just Bricks again, brought to you by Kick It Forward. And of course, Sporting News, uh, we have a very special guest tonight. There's so much basketball on right now. There's NCAA tournament coming out with a lot of Australians playing, the NBL finals, so much NBA as well. Um, and who better to get on than Peter Hawley. Uh, Pete, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Um, you're an NBL commentator now, you're a journalist. You've lent heavily into your post-basketball playing career and how are you enjoying it? Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, It's been a whirlwind, obviously, I think I've tweeted about it a few weeks ago it's been nearly five or five years now since i hung up the boots at 27 but uh, a bit daunting at the start i knew this is what i wanted to do i went i went to college for this kind of media work and uh continued to grow each year but i've absolutely loved it and again just to be on the other side of the court i guess not playing but being able to still follow it and break it down and being that kind of analyst uh, and see how much the league has grown from that perspective in the last five years has been incredible and not just the league australian basketball as a whole so uh, such an exciting time for, for our country and hoops and then leading into paris and everything so uh yeah it's uh it's something that i've uh, enjoyed every step of the way and hopefully continue to do for a bit longer um have you got the call up to paris because i haven't um <laughs> I know you. I you know you're a bit of a hustler, so you'd be pulling strings to get a ticket over there, surely, to get somehow on the basketball. How how's your um how's how's that going to get over to Paris? No, no good. Uh, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm realistic these days, Josh. I understand uh, the my limitations, and I don't know if my World Uni Games tenth place for the Australian team uh, qualifies as, as someone who's going to be over there. Um, but I, there is a lot of bunch of other sports that I think that's what I've got to try and branch into. Right? Maybe it's uh, is the break dancing popping up in this one, or is it the next one? Or break dancing is this one? It's the one off, and then they're getting rid of it. So um, maybe oh, it's break we missed that boat too. <laughs> no, I would have loved you there because I've really, ever since you started doing the commentary, I've actually honestly not trying to like blow smoke up here, but I have, I do really enjoy when I hear you on the call. Um, the NBL season has been a bit nuts. There's been a lot of good teams um, and we've seen it at, a, at the end of the season. We had an upset uh, a couple of nights ago or kind of an upset. Um, what have you made of the final so far? The layout, um, Perth Wildcats, Melbourne United go in kind of the two heavy favourites. Um, are they still the favourites? What have you made of the teams that are going to meet them in the semi-final, do we call it? Mm, yeah, I mean, firstly, the the whole idea of the playing tournament, I think it couldn't have been any better. Uh, and again, the way that the, the NBL is set up where it comes down to percentage, it's not like a head-to-head -head battle for positions, and that makes every regular season game so important. It comes down, every year we say that it can't possibly happen again where it comes down to the last shot. And um, I mean, you looked at it last year, the playing tournament got implemented into the league, uh, comes down to literally the last shot of whether Melbourne United will make the top six or not. And the DJ Vasiljevic missed in Perth, which makes it's so entertaining you've got melbourne united sitting at home and all their fans watching a game that they're not involved in and one of their rivals has a chance to hit a shot that would either put them into the top six or keep them in cancun and they end up staying on holiday so it's kind of uh that's the beauty of it it happened again this year and uh the layout is interesting with the fiba break there's not a whole lot you can do and i'm really intrigued to see how both melbourne and perth handle the 19 days off between games uh how that's going to be in the semis and yeah, I still think they're they're going to be the favourites, but Tassie's one to watch, man. Tassie, I was down there. That place is unbelievable. If you've never experienced it, you've got to get down there. That place is like a college atmosphere, a Euroleague atmosphere, all wrapped up in one. Uh, and the way they're playing, they've been in the finals before. They know what it takes. And if we fast forward a month's time and they're champions, would not shock me whatsoever. Oh, wow. So you're saying that the Jack Jumpers could get their sort of made in championship um, in a very short period of time, just based on what you've seen. So Will Magne, he's come into form again. He's been sort of injury, pardon me, he's been injury plagued the big man for a long time. And we always saw glimpses of what he could do, even had a stint in the NBA at a very young age. Why was he so good the other night? And is he the catalyst to push them through? Yeah, he's the one. And he looked this this whole year and they've been in the league three years now in the competition. And uh, each year they've had a certain fallback or a certain uh, fault that has held them back from getting to that next level. They hang their hat on the defensive end. In the first two years, they missed an extra offensive spark and we continue to see that. Josh Majette was their starting point guard. And uh, when they needed points, they just needed them from a different 
angle and they never had that. Um, and then this year they struggled a bit defensively, but when Magne got healthy and we saw it the other night against Illawarra, that is one of the most individual dominant displays I've seen in some time, not just this year. And yes, he had a double double and I think he had four or five blocks, but I went back and watched the game. There was maybe one or two possessions on both ends of the floor that he didn't impact, whether it was altering the shot, whether it was the way he was hedging the screen, uh, the way he was setting screens, he was absolutely everywhere. And if he's up and about like this, Yes, I think they can actually go on and win it because uh, they've probably done their best job is they've avoided Melbourne United, right? They go to Perth where um, some little whispers come out, Josh, that they want this Perth matchup. They've been looking forward to this Perth matchup for a semi-final series and be careful what you wish for. Um, <laughs> but that's what they want. They want to get that job done. And then if they make a grand final series, they've been to one before. They've been to a championship series. And they've also got this little me weird mental edge, it seems, over Melbourne. So when it gets to a grand final championship series, potentially Melbourne and Tassie, if that's what it comes down to, uh, they're not going to fear it. And they're going to go in there and expect to try and win it again. And again, as I said, I wouldn't be shocked if they could. It's so weird, basketball, how the Sydney Kings lose after back-to-back -back championships and all of a sudden the, there's sort of a light. Uh, it shines on them thinking... Okay, what do they need to change? Do the Australians need to change? There's pressure on them. In Tassie, their, their benefit's been the consistency. They've stood by a guy like Will Magne injured and now it's coming at the right time and they're finding themselves deep into another finals. I'm excited for it. If it, Just quickly, he's timing it well with the, the Olympics coming up. We we have Dort Reith, we have uh, Jock Landau there. Now, they're they're sort of forward centres, even though you know they probably in the international play could easily play centres. But Will Magne's a pure centre. Um, well, more of a dominant centre. Do you see a spot for him somewhere there? What I saw the other night, like I was already thinking at the back end of this year, I'm thinking, okay, he's got to be in the camp. And I still think that's got to be a given. He's got to go to that Boomers camp. And then you just see how he goes. And you're right, you talk about being uh, that kind of true centre. Uh, I think the possibility of having him as that anchor defensively, like you look at his what Aaron Baines was for so long in terms of his size and his uh, his strength. Sets terror screens well, sets screens, he rolls. But the flip side of that is he's a lob threat. Uh, he's always going to be up in the air meeting people at the rim. And that's an exciting thing to have. And would also potentially allow us to slide the guys you mentioned, do up and drop down to the four and stretch the floor. And that would make us a lot more of a third, I think, and a lot bigger. We still have Nick K, you still have these youngsters in like Xavier Cooks and uh, and Jack White. So it's going to be very interesting. But one, he's got to be at the camp. There's no ifs, ands, or buts with what he's done. And then I think if you're Brian Gorgian, you just see what kind of performance he delivers at camp. And again, and we talk about things that wouldn't shock me. If he's on the plane to Paris after he's, the way he's performed, wouldn't surprise me at all. Wow. Um, well, well done to Will Magnate. But uh, going to the other side of the draw, we had a an extremely fiery game between uh, New Zealand and the Sydney Kings. Um, towards the end of the game, it, it felt like Sydney just blew it. They were just turning the ball over. They were um, completely... Uh, it was one of the most bizarre things I've seen. They had so much talent on the floor and they couldn't even hold on to the ball. And they were finding it so hard to get shots. And at the very end of the game, um, Derek Rucker had a player going straight at him and even um, a sideline commentator um, Joe Healy even had a little bit of an interaction as well. Can you talk us through exactly what happened at the end of the game? Because we, I, I personally really enjoyed watching it. Um, what did you make of it all? Uh, I love it. Absolutely love it on both ends. And um, Parker Jackson Carwright, I mean, he was a uh, top three MVP. He's been balling out this year. And uh, that kind of emotion, I think he came out and said it was no disrespect. It was raw emotion. And uh, it's good to know, like, players, players do listen to the media. Whether they say they don't listen to the media or they don't hear the media... <laughs> Whether they go searching for it is one thing, but especially guys who are like high caliber players who have played overseas, they've still got people, whether they've played in, in Europe or America, watching these games and following them going along. Like I think Parker Jackson Carrot has a couple of fan pages of people. Uh, we rightly so. He's an absolute elite uh, bucket getter and he's going to get that kind of stuff sent to him. And uh, whether it was Derek Rucker ranking him seventh in the top 15 of Derek Rucker's players uh, or it was Rucker um, basically riding off the breakers, which a lot of people have with the bad luck of injuries. And I love it. If that's the way that he's going to bounce back, he's going to help them win uh, an elimination game, basically put them on his shoulders and he's done it all season long and then have a bit of a spray. And you, you heard Rucker turn around and say, that's what he wants to have back too. So uh, it's almost a challenge and he rose to it. And again, I'm I'm all for it. There's, I don't think anybody crossed the line. It's that kind of raw emotion to go in to an opposition stadium and silence all the 10,000 plus fans there and get a much needed win and kind of say, hey, it's us against the world. So uh, I'm all for it on both sides and I think everyone handled it pretty well.
Yeah, I, I, I do find it interesting because players always say, coaches always say, I don't really listen to the media, I don't watch it. But myth. The, myth. <laughs> such a myth. And uh, it could be the, the difference is because even if you don't listen to the media, and yes, there are people out there who are legitimately, you know, they don't, they, there's some guys that you in like footy or cricket or, or any sport, NBA, maybe not. Um, even if they don't, their mum's texting him saying, hey, this guy, this guy was really rude about you. And they're like, who the fuck is that? And then they get into it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I think that is a myth. And um, it clearly was. It clearly was uh, in that game. Um, we'll move away from the NBL. Big series ahead. Oh, just quickly, the Perth Wildcats. Uh, it'd be remiss of me not to talk about them. You were saying you, you wouldn't be surprised if they lose. Do you think the, the Alexander Saar, um, what you've seen from him, is it hard to compare with what we saw from, you know, Wemben Yama last year? So there's talk that there's going to be another Frenchman in the top two, top five. Um, but for me, it's so hard to compare the two because we've seen this amazing um, generational talent and then to put them in the same sort of top five ranking. I'm like, well, I don't know if I saw that in Perth with mm. Alexander. What did you What did you see from him this season? Oh, I thought he was through. And again, I think the comparisons, it's uh, its really unfortunate for him because, yeah. and it's not just the French prospect, it's like the body type. And, and again, you looked at it, I think that's what people want to compare to is uh, you actually kind of take them as they are compared to the regular NBA or professional basketball type body, they're unique. Uh, they're, they've got that length, they've got um, they've got the athleticism, they can do all of that. So that's where they kind of are similar, but two completely different players. And what I've seen and compared to some of the other top draft picks, uh, the potential wise, I think there's that's the reason why NBA teams might look at him as not just the number two or top five pick, as the number one pick. There hasn't been standouts right and if you look at what they can build off and what there's already there that raw talent that raw body type that raw athleticism to help mature over the next few years in the nba can be a scary proposition and uh i think he's done incredibly well in limited minutes compared to what Wemby was doing beforehand compared to what other players were doing to ha still have an impact we would have liked to see a whole lot more of that um on the floor but then the flip side of that is the nba is as corey homicide williams says it's not a cupcake league so the end we saw isaiah thomas come out and say he'll win mvp easily of the nbl if he wanted to play and anyone who's followed the nbl long enough knows that that's easily you no one's winning mvp this league is tough and you come in here with plenty of nba players who've come in here in the past and present and either struggled or, or not played to the level that a lot of people thought and i think alex has done a really good job of, of coming in as one young player and leaving as a much more improved player and and going towards uh someone who hopefully i'd like to see shake adam silver's hand first yeah he'd be pretty crazy to think he's been, like been hanging in perth this whole i haven't seen him other than in the games but he's hanging around somewhere in perth just having a good time chilling at the beach and stuff um to then see that he'll probably head over mm. there and make 10 million us a year so uh, <laughs> good on him um speaking of uh, young prospects said to the ncaa because australia will ha potentially have quite a few um plays featuring pretty heavily in the tournament this year uh and this is coming from and we're speaking to a guy who had his own magic moment. Um, talk us through, for those that don't know, you've got, had one of the greatest game winners in NCAA history, maybe Australian and sporting history. I don't want to pump you up. This is the, these are the, this is the moment. Go for it. We can pump it up, right? Hey? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I have no, uh, I, what is it? The GTA meme, the, uh, here we go again, gone writing for once the day comes of the, of the shot. I have no choice. It's just, it's, it's written in the rules that I've got to repost it. It's, it's not my choice. Um, it is fun. It's fun to, I, to relive it every year. And we talk about, uh, like the NBA finals. We talk about NBL finals, pro sport, it, unless you've been a big fan of college basketball, unless you've been part of March, man, unless you don't understand how cool and, uh, how special it is to watch. I watch the tournament every year, even if I don't follow, uh, the, the regular season as much when the tournament comes, everyone's going to do their bracket. And again, the upsets, the emotion, uh, there's really nothing like it. It's the, the fact you have a knockout tournament, uh, with some of the best teams in the country. It's such a joy to watch and, uh, I cannot wait for it to kick off. Now, heading into the year, Tyrese Proctor was a preseason um, All-American, or I, I believe he was extremely hyped regardless. He was um, top 20 in the mock drafts heading into the actual NCAA season. And then out of nowhere, this guy Johnny Furphy's come in, and all mm. of a sudden we have a new sort of top Australian heading into the drafts. People talking about how much NBA teams love guys they can shoot, defend like him, but also they're surprised by his athleticism now. And he's in a Kansas team starting five now, playing really, really well. And um, they're winning. They they found they they were they've been winning all year, but they've definitely found some form recently. Um, do, what do you see them doing, and what have you made of uh, Furphy? Were you aware of him in Melbourne? 
Yeah, we were aware of him. Uh, I was in Summer League in Vegas and Liam Santa Maria, the general manager of the Next Stars, who's done a terrific job. I think he was at the Peach Jammer a couple of things before Summer League began and Johnny Furphy was there. Uh, and he was balling out. And that was kind of the first time if Australians hadn't really had heard of him on, on that stage, realized, hang on, this this kid could be something special. And I mean, we were talking about it before we started this. You go from, okay, you've got a few eyes on you now, not just here, but you've got a few eyes in the States on you and you d- decide to commit to Kansas and you sign to Kansas. Okay, you're going there and people say, okay, he's going to take a couple of years to mature. And now he's at a point where I think he's nearly averaging um, double figures and up there he's had a couple of nine, 10 rebound games and, and all of that. And you've gone from, okay, I'm on the scene. I've had some big dunks and performances in these Peach Jam and these tournaments leading before college. Now I'm all of a sudden I'm on the radar and people are thinking, well, we could get him as part of the Next Starts program. We love the local Next Starts as well as the international ones. And now all of a sudden people are saying, well, he could be a first round pick after this year. If he wants to declare, then I'll, then there's a big choice to have. And I, I don't envy that decision because if that comes at you this quick over just a couple of months and a couple of months in the grand scheme of your career, this is so quick for him to have to decide, do I declare now? Do I go back for another year? Um, what happens? And that's why you need some good people in your corner to help one, pick the right situation, which I think he's done well at Kansas, but two, what's next? Because those choices, they can, uh, they can, as I said, come quick and they can be hard to try and figure out when you've got all this noise around you. Yeah, I mean, if he's a top, if he's in every mock draft saying he's you know top ten to top twenty, why mm. wouldn't just roll the dice and go straight away? Isn't it best for your development to go straight to the NBA? I, this is me not being very good at basketball, but why, why wouldn't you go straight to the top league straight away? I don't know. Uh, what, do you have a belief? I think it's. Yeah, I think it's more to make sure that you are that first round pick, right? Because as soon as you drop to the second round when nothing's guaranteed, that changes everything. So if you're on the bubble of, um, if, if you're popping up in the mock drafts and you, know, you have a look at an agent or you've signed someone, because you can now declare for the draft and then pull your name out and stay in if you don't get that kind of right conversation with NBA teams and have some workouts or whatever. It's more unique and better situated for the player now than when I was playing, which I think is great. You want players to be able to have a choice. And if they back themselves and say, I'm going to the draft, and then they realize a couple months after that, and I'm not sure if this year is best for me, they should be allowed to go back to school. Uh, and they, you weren't allowed to do that a few years ago. But yeah, if he's anywhere from above in the top 20, I'd say, maybe 25, you'd be definitely looking at it. But if you're 20 and anywhere from 20 to 35-ish, you'd have to have that thought of, you don't want to slip to the second round where nothing's guaranteed. And uh, if you get picked up in the second round, I look at a guy like Luke Travers, right? It's exceptional to be drafted. I think he will um, hopefully get another chance in the NBA this year. I think he's done terrific uh, to deserve that, whether it's a two-way deal. Uh, but he went over to Summer League last year and he this was his second year and because he was drafted late second round with the Cavs they hold his rights for two years and he went into the summer league for the second year absolutely balled out they won an NBA uh, NBA summer league championship uh, which is very unique for Australians for sure but they already filled all four two-way spots before it started and he played really well that if he hadn't been drafted by that team he's landing on a two-way somewhere else every other team would have wanted to have him on a two-way but because Cleveland had his rights and already filled it he was unfortunate that he missed out. And that's where I look at it. I was like, that's that key thing. Okay, a uh, guy like Justin Robinson on the Hawks, he had a chance to be drafted after the college in the second round. He chose not to um, because he wanted to go a different route. So it's unique for, compared to us here. <laughs> that's true. Um, what have you made of Tyrese Proctor's year so far? I mean, he, he's been so highly touted. He's on such a, you know, a strong program. Uh, do, do you see him going to the NBA next year straight away or is it another year at college? I think it's we, we're going towards that extra year uh, for Tyrese, which might not be a bad thing. Um, the problem, well, the, again, you talk about a decision which might be harder for him to have to think about is uh, there's no real clear cut top picks. I mean, there's top picks, but no, like you talk about last year, everyone knew Wemby was going to be number one um, and all of that. He's averaged nearly double figures for two years in a row. He's more efficient this year. He looks a lot more poised the way he's playing. And again, we have that conversation of, uh, do I want to have another year? Okay, I'll be going into my junior year. Will this be my year to shine? Or will I become the main playmaker, the main scorer from that? I mean, anytime you average double figures in Division One basketball, and especially at the high majors, you're elite. And I think he's, we know he's a star of the future. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if he wanted to declare and get picked up because I think the talent's going to be there. And uh, I want to see him in the NBA sooner rather than later. Also want to see him in a boomer's jersey because I think he's got a long uh, career ahead in the Australian colors. Uh, just go back, going back to the NBL, are there any guys in the Australian comp that you think will have a look in this year? 
uh, whether that's, you know, a summer league look, which obviously a lot of people get a look in or even a chance at an NBA contract uh, this year that we're maybe not thinking of? Well, I mean, Jalen Galloway's one. Uh, it's probably a watch this space right now. I, I, I love Joe Ingles. Everyone, it's hard not to love him, but um, there's a whole side of TikTok of showing Joe Ingles highlights um, because, <laughs> because he, you know, he looks a little bit older because he's obviously got the hairline and um, just the way he's built, even though he used to be so athletic. But there's a whole version of TikTok where they're showing coast to coast with Orlando, him doing these like crazy layups and um, just showing his athleticism. I, I, I hope for the day he's like 37, playing in the NBL, and it looks like a rec league. Moving the same. Yeah, moving the same, but it looks like a rec league and he's tearing people up. I, I'd, I'd pay to watch that. They should just buy a team. Buy a team. They've got the funds. Um, hey, watch that space as well. I've had some. Whoa. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, again, yeah, you spoke about I me. Mean, Bogut did it. And when you've got that kind of money and you say, like, look, I just want to be part of a team. I don't know how, I mean, the owner player kind of vibe works, but uh, that's uh, when you decide you want to come back and you want to invest in the Australian basketball. It's, it, it seems more likely than it is unlikely, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. Well, I saw, I saw this meme the other day where they were saying, did, did Paddy Mills make the right decision to not play footy and play basketball? because he was good mm. footy and I was like, is that even a question? He made 75 million US this year. He, he won championships, he won a bronze medal, obviously it's it's basketball. But then I was like, wow, he won seven, He made 75 million US. That's, that's a lot of money. Um, we're running out of time, Pete. Uh, so who's your prediction for the NBL finals? Uh, and also just give us your, your tip for who you like in the NBA as well. Uh, I, I just think the depth of Melbourne United, they've been top all season long. They haven't lost back-to-back -back games. And just that fact alone, right? They haven't lost back-to-back -back games. And if a team wants to beat them, they're going to have to do that uh, at some stage is, is win two games against them or three games against them in a grand final championship series. It's going to be very hard to do, so I can't go past them. Uh, the NBA, I think I'm on the Denver train again. And the more I keep watching it, they look like a team who... Right now, I don't really care because, and I think they don't care because they know when the lights come on that they'll turn up. And, and Jokic, who, uh, if he, they played in Brooklyn a couple of weeks ago before the All Star break, and this man was at the trots the night before, watching the trots go around, and then went to Brooklyn and probably had a triple double. Like that's the kind of care factor he doesn't care. And I say that I don't think they care because they don't need home court advantage in the West right now. With they've got OKC ahead of them and Minnesota, both the teams. I think they think that if they get home court, it doesn't matter. They can go in there and still beat them and come out the West. And um, I just don't trust Boston yet uh, in a series or in the playoffs until Jalen Brown finds a left hand, which I'm not sure he's going to beat those allegations based on some TikToks I've seen as well. <laughs> well, it's good our research is in the right spot. Um, oh, just <laughs> one quickly before you go, Josh Giddy. you obviously mentioned him in the finals push. What have you made of his season um, after the All-Star break? It feels like they're the most exciting team in the whole NBA to watch right now, and it's kind of a coin flip. It feels like for everyone thinking how they're actually going to go in the uh, in the playoffs this year. Yeah, I mean, they're way ahead of everybody's schedule. No doubt about that. And I guess um, that with Josh Giddy, we, we can see how good he can be. And But now that the, the emergence of Jalen Williams playing alongside SGA, who's an MVP candidate, and Chet, uh, it's kind of made Josh slide out of the rotation at certain parts of the, uh, of the game. And I think he's still impacting in the right way when he can. What happens in the future with Josh at OKC? I think Gazy mentioned that he might have to go and, and potentially find a, a different suiting program, which I'm all for, to be honest. I look at other teams around who could use that kind of true point guard and that his core vision, uh, and there's a list of them. So I think he could really land and help another team. But until then, uh, I'd love to see this OKC team go. I'd love to watch them the way they play. They're probably the most enjoyable team to watch in the competition for me. Well, people, teams always you know, have their rise or their push for the finals before you think they're ready. So maybe this is the year they surprise everyone uh, well before anyone thought they were ready. Uh, Pete, thank you so much. Look out for Pete during the NBL uh, finals. Uh, he'll be commentating and um, good luck for everything, mate. It's going to be a big year. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me.